it on my laptop screen Ready for the Python scene All those lines of text so clean Let's code and chase that dream Python world, here we go Write the script, let it flow In this video, we're going to talk about user-defined functions in Python and more importantly, how you can create your own functions in your Python programs. And the way we declare a function is to use the define keyword, which is DEF. So when we want to make a function, we need to declare two things. We need to declare a function header as well as the function's body. The function header is the first line of the function, and it sets up a few things that we're going to need to know to both code the function as well as later call on that function and make use of it. And a function header starts with the define keyword, followed by the function's name. And this name has to follow the same sort of naming rules that we use for variables. Then a list of parameters in parentheses. And these are the inputs the function is going to take. This list could be of zero or more parameters. At the end of the function header, we're going to have a colon that represents the end of the line. And then that is going to be followed by the function's body. The function's body is an indented block of code, and it contains all the statements that are going to be executed when this function is called. It's going to be very similar to what we've seen already with if statements and loops, where that's an indented block after the function header. So let's take a look. So in this example we're going to look at, we are going to define a function that prints a line of asterisk characters of a given length. So if we input a 1, that's going to just be one asterisk character. If we input a five, it'll be five asterisk characters in a row. And this definition is going to look something like this. So let's break it down and see what each part is. So the first part here and the very first line of the function is the function header, and that contains all those elements we just talked about. The other big part is the function's body. These are all the statements that are going to be executed when we call this function. Now, an important note here is the indentation. Remember, indentation is very important in Python. It lets us know what blocks of code are in other blocks. So in this case, after a function header, we need one level of indentation to denote that all of these lines are contained inside the function. If we have something like a for loop or an if statement in that function, that's going to need a second level of indentation to show, for example, this print line is inside this for line, which is inside this function. So every time we define a new block of code, it has to be indented an additional level. So let's take a closer look and start breaking down this function header. So first we have the define keyword. This is always the same for any function definition. Every function definition has to start with the characters D, E, F, and then a space. Next is the function's name. And this is how we're going to refer to this function in our code and what's going to let us call this function later on. So it is important that this name follows the same rules for naming variables, and the recommendation is to use snake case. Next, we're going to have a list of parameters. In this case, there's only one parameter length. If we had additional parameters, we would separate them with commas. And these represent the different inputs that are going to go into our function, and then we can use these different inputs like variables inside of the function. Then lastly, we end our function header with a colon character. So let's zoom out and see how we would actually run this function. Now, if we just wrote this code in a Python file and hit run, nothing would happen because this just sets up our function. It's sort of like assigning a value to a variable that doesn't do anything on its own. So to actually run this function, we have to call the function. And this is just like we've called the built-in functions we've used before, like print, input, int, power, all of those functions that we've been already using that are already built into Python are called the same way. So in this case, we're calling the function line that we've created with the value 5. And we do that by saying the function's name, and then the parentheses, and we give any arguments to that function. Remember, the arguments are the actual values that we're sending into the function. So in this case, we're calling the line function with the argument 5. That means the actual value 5 is sent into the function, and length becomes equal to 5. The for loop then runs, and we run this for loop five times. Each time the for loop runs, it outputs a single asterisk. And because we're telling the print um, command that the end is now going to be an empty string, that means all of these asterisks are going to be printed on the same line. 
After that for loop's done, we just call print with no argument, and that simply prints a line break to start a new line. So the output of this would be five asterisk characters and then a line break. But we're not limited to only calling our function once. We could call it again however many times we want. So in this new line now, we're calling the line function and we're sending in the value 10. The same thing happens again, but now length is equal to 10, and we get a different output, which is 10 asterisk characters and then a line break. So this is very powerful because it allows us to reuse our code, but with slightly different values so we can get different outputs. This would save us a lot of time because without this function, we'd have to type out that for loop over and over again, but with different values. This reuse is super important in programming, not only because it saves us time coding, but it also saves us time testing. When we want to test our code and try to find a bug or debug something, now we know that the lines are always printed by the line function. So we don't have to search all over our file for the bug, we can focus right in on the functions. So it's always great to split up our code into as many functions as is appropriate, so we can make debugging easier as well as save time not repeating the same lines of code. Also, if you're to make another program later on, you can reuse this function. So you don't have to go back to the drawing board every time you start a new program. So there is another thing that we should point out here. The order of when we call the function versus when we define the function is quite important. We can only call functions that have already been defined, like we see here on the left. We define the function first, and then we call it. If we tried to flip this around, like calling the function first and then defining it, this would not work. In fact, we would get an error that looks something like this, saying name line is not defined. And in this case, it has a recommendation, did you mean slice, which isn't correct. But an important point here is that we have to define our functions before we use them, just like we have to define our variables before we use them. So keep in mind, the order we define functions in can be important. So let's look at a more complex example now and explore how we can use this line function to do something more interesting. So in this example, we want to use that line function we just took a look at. And we want to output a pyramid made of asterisk characters of a given height input by the user. I have the solution up here now, but let's trace through it and see exactly how it works. So remember, our Python code starts at the first line and runs downwards. However, a common mistake new programmers make is thinking that means that the function is going to run because it's at the top of the code. But remember, this is just a function definition. It defines the function and lets Python know about it, but this function doesn't run until we call it. So now at this point, Python knows about this function, but we don't run the function. We go to the next line that actually has a statement we can execute. And the first line that we can actually execute is height equals the input from the user. So in this case, we're asking the user to input the pyramid height. This is going to be the tallest point of our pyramid. And we're going to convert that into an integer value and store it in our height variable. And that's going to look something like this, asking the user input pyramid height. And for this case, we'll pretend we input a three. So three is going to be stored in the computer's memory as height. We continue running and we get to this for loop. And this for loop is using the range function to loop through a sequence of numbers. In this case, that sequence is going to start at the number one and run all the way up to height inclusive. It's inclusive because we added plus one. Normally, the range function is exclusive for the stop value but inclusive for the start value. K is going to start at 1 because 1 is the first value in this range, and this loop is going to run until K is equal to height. So we enter the loop with K equals 1, and now we are going to call the line function. In this case, the argument that we're going to pass to the line function is the value of K. So K is currently equal to 1, so that means a 1 is going to be sent as input into our line function, and the length is going to become equal to 1. Then execution is going to jump, and we're going to run the first line in the line function. So, so far in this point in the course, we've mostly seen sequential code. That's one line after the other. Sometimes there's loops, but it's still fairly linear. With functions, this allows us to jump into another block of code. So in this case, we're jumping into the line function. We're going to run the line function. When that's done, we then jump back to where we called it from. So in this case, the first line of the line function is a for loop. And this loop is going to run for i in all the values of range. The only thing we're giving the range function is the value 1. So when we only give it one value, that is the stop value. 
and the start value defaults to zero. So this loop is going to start with i equals to zero, and it's going to only run for that value. The only line in this for loop is a simple print statement that outputs an asterisk. We use the keyword argument end to set the end to an empty string, which means this print statement won't put a line break at the end. Instead, it will keep printing out asterisks on the same line each time this loop repeats. However, in this case, since length is equal to one, this loop only runs once for the value of i equals zero. After that, it exits. And then we run the last line of this function, which is simply a print statement with no argument. When print has no arguments at all, it simply just prints one line break. This is important because it gets us to the next line in the terminal. So the next time we call this function, we're not putting out more asterisks on the same line. After we get to the end of this function, we now jump back to where we called it, which was right here in this for loop. The for loop then restarts. So k is incremented to two, and we enter the loop again. This time, when we call the line function, we send it an argument of two, which means that length is gonna be set equal to two, and we enter in the line function again, but this time for length equals to two. So this time this loop's gonna run for i equals zero, and then i equals one. So for i equals zero, we output an asterisk, the loop repeats, i is incremented to one, and we output a second asterisk. At this case, i is gonna be equal to length if we increment it again, so we don't run the loop again, we exit the loop. We run this last print line, it prints an invisible line break character, and then we resume execution back where we called this function, which is in this for loop. And this for loop repeats, k is incremented to three, we enter the loop again, and we would call the line function again, I won't trace through it this time, and they would output three asterisks this time, because we gave it three as input. Next, this loop would finally be over because k is equal to height, so we go to the second loop. The second loop is what's gonna print the other side of the pyramid. And the difference here is this loop is counting down. So it's gonna start at height minus one, which is two, and it's gonna run down to one. So here we start with j equals two, we're going to call the line function again, this time with a value of two. The value of two is going to go into the line function, length is going to be equal to two, and it prints out two asterisks, which we see on the screen now. This function repeats, j is going to be decremented to one. We enter the loop again, we call line with a value of one, it prints out a single asterisk character, and now we are at the end of the loop, and then the program exits. Now you can see we've printed out a pyramid, that at the highest point has a height of three asterisk characters. So if you're not too sure about how these functions work, I highly recommend trying this program out in PyCharm and maybe even debugging it with the debugger so you can step through it step by step. Maybe even try different ways of printing it and maybe try to print the pyramid the other way for some good practice. Now, another thing about functions we have to mention and talk about is the return statement. And this is how we can send values back from a function to the caller. In that last example we saw, that function was only printing things out to the terminal. It had no return value. Functions that we've seen that are already built into Python, like the pow function, return a value back that we can store in a variable, for example, or do something with that value. The way that we can tell Python that this function returns a value is with the return keyword. So let's take a look at an example. This example seems a little bit more complicated, but the function is actually still fairly straightforward. In this case, it is a function that finds the volume of a rectangular pyramid. And the equation for this is fairly straightforward. The volume is equal to the length times the width times the height times one third. We could also represent this as the length times the width times the height, all together divided by three. Those would be equivalent. So let's see how this function is implemented. First, we have the function's name. In this case, it's pyramid underscore vol for volume. We have a list of parameters. In this case, we're taking in three inputs, the base, the height, and the length. We need all of these values to calculate the volume based on this formula. And here, we're actually doing the calculation in this function's body. It's fairly straightforward. We're multiplying the base input times the height input times the length and dividing that by three. We're storing that result in volume. The last line of this function is our return statement. Return statements always start with the return keyword written exactly like this, 
and then a space, and then they are followed by some expression. So this expression could just be a hard-coded value, it could be a variable, or it could actually be some sort of arithmetic. In this case, it's just the volume variable. So this means we're going to return whatever value is currently stored in the volume local variable. This then gets returned to whatever part of Python is calling this function. We could then store this in a variable, use it in another expression, or in some other statement. The remaining lines of this program are going to be getting the input from the user. You should be fairly familiar with input lines by now, but this is getting input, converting it to a floating point value, and then storing it in a few different variables. The next line is where we actually call the function. Remember, the function doesn't run on its own. Just because it's at the top of the code doesn't mean it runs when execution gets there. That just defines the function. To use the function, we have to call it. And that's what we're doing on this line by saying the function's name, the parentheses, and then the list of the inputs. In this case, the inputs are going to be the base length, the base width, and the height value that we input from the user. And these values would be sent to the pyramid volume function. So base is going to be equal to whatever base width was, height is going to be equal to whatever height value was, and length is going to be equal to whatever base length is. It is important the order that we send these values in into the function because they have to be in the same order as we defined our parameters. So in this case, base always has to come first, then height, then length. And in this function, we are returning the volume. So it's going to do that calculation to find the volume, and it's going to return it back to the line that called it. So in this case, the line that called it was an assignment line, and the result of that expression on the right-hand side of the assignment is going to be equal to the value returned by the function. That value is then going to be stored in the variable listed on the left-hand side, which is pyramid volume. So pyramid volume will be equal to whatever the result of this function is. Then finally, we just print out the value and round it to two decimal places. So if we were actually to run this, and let's say we put it in a 5, a 10, and a 15, it would call that function with those values, do the calculation, return the result, with this, which is 250, and then it would print that out to the screen. Now, it's also important to note that functions don't have to have a return statement. We already saw previously that line function, which only printed asterisks as output. It didn't have a return statement. We can also see on the screen now, we have a new example called print hello, which simply outputs hello and then someone's name. And it also doesn't have a return statement. So what happens when there's no return statement? Well, in that case, we get a value of none returned. Remember, none is a special value in Python, that represents no value, a default value, value hasn't been set, something like that. In this case, when we try to call this function with the value Alice, we'll get hello Alice. This is printed by this print line here. And because we're storing the return of this function in the variable x, and then outputting x, we also get none printed. Now I should note that you don't have to store the value returned by a function. For example, this is perfectly legal. We could just call print hello and do nothing with the return value. And this is quite common when functions return none. But we can also do this with functions that do return a value. In that case, we just ignore the value that's returned. Now, we can also have multiple return statements within a single function. And this can be helpful because it allows for flexible control and it allows us to exit a function early under certain conditions. When the return statement is run, we immediately exit that function and return the value that's given. If there's any lines of code that follow, we completely ignore those. So here's a fairly simple example. And this returns a string of positive, negative, or zero. And what it does is it categorizes a number. So we send in a number. If it's positive, we return positive. If it's negative, we return negative. And if it's zero, we return zero. As I mentioned, functions exit as soon as they reach a return statement. So in this example, if number was greater than zero, we would immediately return positive because we reached the return positive line. We wouldn't evaluate any other parts of the if statement or any lines after the if statement. We'd exit as soon as we hit return. So with that in mind, I want you to try to predict what the output of this function will be. Let's say with a value of 200 as well as a value of 38. What will be the returns for both of these? I'm going to put up a timer, try to predict it, and once you have an answer, unpause the video. Lines of 
blowing through my pen Our glass is running out Gotta solve this right, no doubt Deadline's looming, it's so tight Tick-tock goes the clock at night Functions, loops, and ifs and else's Each line fixes all my messes And we're back. So the key here is that return age is valid is outside of these if statements. However, the other two return lines cause the function to exit immediately. So if age is less than zero, that means that we're going to return error age can't be negative right away, and we'll never reach the line that says return age is valid. Same thing with age being greater than 120. That means as soon as we reach this line, we're going to return error age seems unrealistic and we never resume execution after the if statement because we exit the function and resume execution back where we called the function. So this means that for validate age with an argument of 200, the output would be error age seems unrealistic. We wouldn't make it to that last line, so that is all the output. There's not like a second string. Now for validate age 38, the output would just be age is valid, Neither of the if statements were true, so we don't run either of those returns. We just run the return at the end, which is age is valid. Next, we need to talk about how arguments are passed to functions. If you recall from our previous video, we talked a little bit about what arguments and parameters are and the difference between them. In short, arguments are the actual values that we're sending into the function, where our parameters are the different inputs a function can take, and they're usually named in that list of parameters in our function header. So how does Python actually pass these arguments? And what happens if we modify them in the parameters of the function? Well, in Python, we use a mechanism called pass by assignment. And the way pass by assignment works means that we don't pass the actual value of an object, we pass a reference to the object. And that reference is assigned to a parameter. That's a bit complicated and it might make more sense when we start talking about object-oriented programming, but for now, we can think about this in terms of immutable arguments and mutable arguments. So if the parameter is given a value that is immutable, meaning that it can't be changed, so that's things like strings, integers, floats, then changing that parameter in a function will have no effect on the original argument outside the function. If a parameter is mutable, meaning that we can change and edit it, that would be things like lists, then changing that parameter inside of a function will modify the original object. I realize that sounds a bit confusing, so let's take a look at an example. Here we have a function called mystery. It takes in two parameters, x and y, and inside this function, we're setting x equal to 2, y equal to 40, calculating x plus y, and returning that result. Outside of the function, before we call it, we set a equals 10, b equals 22, and we send those values into mystery, and then we get the result stored in C and print them out to the screen. But the question is, what will the output be? Especially what will the value of A and B be here? We do edit the values of X and Y inside the function, but does that have any effect on A and B? I'll give you a few minutes to think about it and put a timer on the screen. If you need more time, pause the video and unpause when you have an answer. Lines of code on screen again. Flowing through my pen Our glass is running out Gotta solve this right, no doubt Deadline's looming, it's so tight 
And we're back. So how does this code work? Well, we're going to start over here with a equals 10 and b equals 22. Remember, even though the function is defined first, it doesn't actually run that function. It just lets Python know that it exists. It only runs when we call it. So the first lines that really happen are going to be setting a equals to 10 and b equals to 22. We then move on to our function call. So we're calling the mystery function with the arguments a and b. A is equal to 10 and b is equal to 22. So these values go in and the parameter x is equal to the value of a, which is 10, and the parameter y is equal to the value of 22, which it got from b. Now there is some important technical details here. What we're actually passing isn't the value. We're passing a reference to the object. So we're passing a reference to a spot in the computer's memory where we have the 10 integer object. And this is an immutable object, so we can't actually edit the value of that object. Instead, we're just sort of pointing at it in the memory. This becomes important for the next lines. On these next lines, we have x equals 2 and y equals 40. So what this is doing, it isn't changing the value of the object it's pointing at. Instead, it's pointing x and y at new integer objects because they're immutable. So x is now going to point at a new integer object that's equal to 2, and y is pointing at a new integer object that's equal to 4. This distinction is important because it tells us that a and b won't change their value. They're still pointing at the integer object 10 and the integer object 22. So editing the parameters in the function has no impact on the variables outside of the function if they're immutable like the integers are. On the next line, we're simply doing a calculation, which is the value currently x has pointed to, and the value y is currently pointing to added together. So because x is 2, y is 40, this equals 42. We then return this value, and that's whatever the value is in z, which is 42. This value is returned to the line calling the function, and this expression is evaluated to equal to 42, and that is stored in c. Now, an important thing to note here is after we exit a function, we lose access to the local variables and the parameters. So that means we can no longer access x, y, or z, because we're now outside of the function. Those get collected by the garbage collector because there's no longer a reference to them. But we still have the return of the function, 42, stored in C. So we then move on to calling the last line, which simply prints out the values with some line breaks to make it more readable. In this case, A and B, as we can see, have their original value still. They weren't impacted at all by altering the parameters in the mystery function. And c is equal to 42 because that is the return of the function. So the important thing to note here are integers are immutable. That means their value is not updated by the function. Other immutable types are things like floats as well as strings. So trying to alter their values by editing a parameter will have no impact on the variables outside of the functions. Now we're going to take a look at an example that uses a mutable type. We haven't talked too much about mutable types yet in the course, but keep in mind they are types that can be edited, appended to, and altered in some way, unlike things like integers and strings. One example of a mutable type is a list, which is a collection of different objects that is ordered. And we're going to be talking more about lists, sets, dictionaries, and tuples later in the course, but for now we're just going to take a look at this example that tries to edit a list in a function. Don't worry if some of these parts don't make sense yet, we will be talking more about lists later. 
So in this case, we have a function, and this function is called mystery2. Inside this function, we do a few things. First, we try to update the value of the first element of the list to be equal to zebra. So in this case, if we're sending cat, duck, dog, then it would try to change cat to zebra. Then we're trying to append to the list using the append method, and this is going to add the value penguin to our list. So what happens when we run this function? Well, we would see that the list is actually updated, even though the list is declared outside of the function. So the first line that's run would be making the list and sending it to cat, duck, and dog. We then call the mystery2 function and send it the list. It then makes those alterations to the list, setting cat to zebra and adding penguin to the list. And we can see, even though this function didn't return anything, these changes to the list do take effect outside of the function because this was a mutable type. If this was an immutable type, there would be no change. But in this case, because it was mutable, we see the changes. So to summarize quickly, immutable types aren't altered by changing the parameter in the function, whereas mutable types can be altered, such as changing a list element or appending a new one. So what is good and bad programming practice when it comes to altering or modifying parameter values? Well, in general, you don't want to do this. It makes your code a lot more confusing and harder to read. So only edit or alter parameter values if you're working with a mutable type and your goal actually is to alter that. Otherwise, you should be defining new local variables rather than altering parameter values. This makes it far easier to debug and far easier for a reader of your code to understand what you're trying to do. Another concept we should explore is calling functions from other functions. So when we're in a function, we're not limited to just doing the standard built-in functions or doing the standard loops and if statements. We are free to call other functions, even functions we've created, from inside of a function. And this helps us break down complex tasks into smaller, more manageable parts. It also allows for reuse of code. Let's take a look at an example. Here we have a program that's defining two functions, square and sum of squares. And they do pretty much what you'd expect. Square takes the square of a number that's input to it, and sum of squares takes two numbers, a and b, it takes the square of those numbers, adds them together, and returns their value. What's interesting here is sum of squares uses the square function to find those squares. So when we run this program, we would start by inputting the values from the user, converting them to a float, and storing them in x and y. But the first real interesting line is down here, where we actually call the sum of squares function. And we're going to pass two arguments, the value currently in x and the value currently in y. These are sent up to the sum of squares function, and a is going to be equal to whatever x was, and b is going to be equal to whatever y was. Next, inside this function, we have two function calls on the same line, and they are both to the square function, but they send different values. So the first one is sending the value that's stored in A, and then it calls the square function, which calculates the square by times the number by itself, and then it returns that value. So the expression square A is going to be evaluated, and the result is going to be returned. Then. The next function call is going to be called. This is calling square again, but with the value of b. b is going to be sent as an argument, and the parameter number is going to be equal to that value. We then calculate the square by times in number times number, and that result is returned. And then square b, that expression, is evaluated to be whatever that return is. This means the overall return of sum of squares is going to be the sum of whatever the return of square a was, and the return of whatever square b is. This result is going to be sent back to where we called the function, and then that is going to be stored in the result variable. So if we were to run this code and we were input 2 and 5, we would get an output of 29. 2 would be sent in as a to sum of squares, 5 would be sent in as b to sum of squares, then sum of squares would call square with a value of 2 for a, so it would be 2 times 2, and then it calls square again for the value of 5 for b, which would be 5 times 5. Those results are added together, and we get a result of 29, which is then printed to the screen. So this can be a little bit complicated to trace through, but understanding this is important because it allows us to reuse code and break our code into smaller, more reusable parts. This saves time debugging, time creating new functions, as well as time writing out lines of code.
Now, one thing we mentioned at the start of the course was that Python does have a style guide called PEP8. And this tells us best practices for formatting and styling our code. These aren't things that would cause errors in our code or make our program incorrect or not run. They're just best practices for the best way to write our code to make it the most readable and standardized as possible. This is similar to like how you might follow the APA style guide when you're writing an English essay. Not following it doesn't mean that the facts in your English essay are incorrect, but it means that the style might be harder for people to read if it's not standardized. And PEP8 does have some things to say about functions. And one of them is that we should use two blank lines to separate function definitions. So whenever we have a function definition, we should have two blank lines separating it from other lines of code, as well as other function definitions. And these are invisible, so I'm showing them here with the slash end character. The other thing PEP8 says about functions are their names. So function names should be written in lowercase letters, and we should use underscore characters to separate words. This is called snake case, just like we use for variable names. Another concept we talked about at the beginning of the course was typing and how Python uses dynamic typing, which is a bit different than other languages you may have used that have static typing. Dynamic typing means that variable types are determined at runtime rather than being declared explicitly by the programmer. And the same is true with parameters to functions. And this is both good and bad. It's good because it gives us some flexibility to allow our functions to accept a wide range of different types of arguments. It's bad because it also means that we could send invalid types into our functions and get nonsensical results. The Python philosophy is to give the programmer the power to do what they want and to assume they know what they're doing. So this means most of our functions aren't going to have too much type checking. They're going to assume that the programmer actually knows what they're doing when they are sending the correct types into the functions. So let's take a look at an example where this causes some interesting properties. Here we have an add function, and it's fairly simple. It takes in two values, adds them together, and returns the result. But because we are dynamically typed in Python, this can have some interesting effects if we send different types of values. So the first time we're calling it, we're simply calling it with the values three and five. These are integer values. And we get a result that you would expect. Three plus five is eight. And we print that on the next line. However, what happens if we call it with something that isn't an integer value? Down here, we're calling it with two strings, hello, comma, space, and world. And when we run this, we can see the output actually concatenates the strings. Because when we add two strings together, we concatenate the result. This is in some ways good because it means this function now works for two different things. It can work for integers and it can work for strings. But it also means this can cause issues. For example, if we were to call this function with like a three and then the second argument being world, we would get an error saying that we can't add an integer to a string. This dynamic typing is very important to keep in mind when we're both writing our own functions and using other people's functions, whether those are built into Python or from some third party library. When we're using someone else's functions, we should be reading the documentation and understanding what types these functions expect. The last thing we need to know about functions in Python are default parameter values. And we've already seen this a little bit while we're using functions. For example, with the print function, we had some optional arguments like end and set for separator that we could use. However, we can also do this while we're making our own functions we can define certain parameters to have a default value. This means if no value is provided by whatever's calling our function, it assumes the default value. So essentially this allows for optional arguments that don't have to be provided. And it also allows us to define default behavior of our function. Let's look at an example. Here we have a function called calculate price. This function takes in a few different parameters. We have base price, which is the price of the item or the order that we're calculating the tax and discount on. We have tax rate, which is the current sales tax. And we have discount, which is going to be some discount applied to the sale. But what's important here is that we have two defaults set. So tax rate has a default value of 13% or 0.13. Discount, on the other hand, has a default value of zero. And the way we define this is with an equal sign after the parameter and then the default value. And we can see some examples of what happens when we actually call this function or how we can call it. 
So in this first case, we're calling calculate price, and we're only providing it with an argument of 100. This means that base price is going to be set to 100 since it's the first argument, and the other arguments are going to be set to their default values. So tax rate will be 13%, 0.13, and discount will take on its default value of 0. So we don't get any errors when we don't provide these. Instead, the function just runs with these default values. In the next line, we're now calling the same function. We're giving it 100 again for the first argument, so that's going to be base price. But now we're setting the tax rate at 8%, or 0.08. We can see discount still gets its default value of 0, but now tax rate is getting our value that we're explicitly sending to it, which is 0.08. In the next line, again, we're sending 100 as our first argument, so that gets set to base price. And now we're explicitly setting discount to 10. Tax rate, on the other hand, doesn't get a value, so it assumes its default value of 13% or 0.13. We're using keyword arguments here to specify exactly which parameter we mean. If we left them out, it would just assume that the next one is going to be for tax rate. So when you have default values, if you're trying to leave out one that's in the middle, like tax rate here, it is important to use a keyword argument to say that this 10 is for discount and not for tax rate. And if we were actually to run this, we would get 105, 108, and 95. That's all I have for you in this video on user-defined functions. In our next video, we're going to be exploring incremental development, and we're actually going to get into PyCharm and start writing some functions. Thank you for watching, and have a great day.